Welcome to the webinar. It is Saturday, September 12th, 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time here in Texas, where I am. I'm Dr. Peggy Simmingson, Associate Professor of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Texas at Arlington, where I'm a professor. And we're joined by Dr. Mohan Pant, Assistant Professor of Curriculum and Instruction. And we are also joined by two of our former undergraduates who have gone on to become classroom teachers and are currently working on their master's degrees at UT Arlington. And we have Ali Capasso and we have Nellie Tinajero. And they'll be joining us today and they will be our main speakers. I'll introduce this session and get us going. So welcome everyone. If you want to type a hello in the chat window, that would be wonderful or good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so just to state, these are our opinions, personal opinions and suggestions. They don't reflect on UT Arlington. And our goal is to hear a variety of viewpoints. It's nice to hear from our grads because they came from UTA and they are still connected to UTA and they're sharing their wisdom from their years of experience. I see that Dr. John Smith just joined. He is our department chair and um, coordinates all the many programs in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. So here are some tips. You might want to take notes. I take notes old school style. I even doodle. Um, sometimes, and so keep a notepad handy if you and if you plan on attending more than one of these webinars. Have any of you been to any of our previous webinars before? Just give us a green check, yes, if you have, um, or no, if you haven't. We're going to have some each month. An upcoming webinar is October 10th. Um, let me go back. October 10th webinar is Teaching with Edmodo in K-12 settings. And then also, it's, we're going to have a guest speaker who's also an alumni, Dr. Harrison McCoy from Arlington ISD. Just a reminder, please check out our social media so that you can um, check out the archives. And you can see our previous sessions. They're really good. And this, if you don't have a lot of time, the slide share is the best one to check out. Okay, we were chatting before the session started. Where are we? So you can use the pen tool, which is the third button down in the little strip next to the map. Or you can just type in the chat window, where are you? It's fun to see if people come from outside of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So where is everybody at? Or just type it. Let's give us a minute. Some of us are from the Dallas Metroplex which is comprised of many cities. If you just joined us, we're just chatting. Hearst, Arlington, Mansfield, Dallas, lots of Metroplex, Colleyville. Okay, Crowley, Euless. Okay, I think we're all in the Dallas area so far that people have typed. Anybody outside? No, it's mainly um, people in the area. So if you just joined us, we're seeing where we're from seeing where we're at, and in a minute I'm going to ask you if you're a pre-service teacher or a graduate or a new teacher, that kind of thing. Awesome. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, let's do another poll. Where are you in your teaching career? So the, the drop-down is next to the hand. It's in the middle of the participants' window and go ahead and vote A, B, C, D, or E. So I'm faculty, so I'm E. Or if you want, if you're not able to access the poll, you can just type it in the chat window. We're kind of a mixed group, lots of pre-service teachers, student teaching. Okay, great. And we've got some people working on post-back. Okay, excellent. I'm going to display the polling results. Okay, so we're kind of a mix there. We've got a grad and 
a non-UTA grad and a fourth year teacher and some faculty. Okay, great, excellent, thanks you guys. Let's get started with our topic. So our topic is data-driven teaching. We have a few key ideas, which I'll go over in a moment, but as you know, any good teacher asks what people already know about a topic. So type into the white area, that, in, or you can use the chat window. You can type on the whiteboard or type in the chat window. What comes to mind when you hear the term data-driven teaching? So we'll give people about a minute to type and just read through other people's responses as well. And faculty can type responses, too. Okay, we've got some ideas. Technology, careful observation of classroom activity. I like that. It's more than just numbers. We, we also use observation. Okay, great. Let's see what other people say. Teaching based on useful facts and technology. I see a lot of people mentioning technology, and we will too. And we'll also mention some low-tech ways to get to know kids. T teaching based on, okay, you teaching using research data. Better idea of where students are. Assessment and instruction go hand in hand. Great. Assessment makes instruction more purposeful. Excellent. To me, it saves time. You're not wasting time teaching something the student already knows. And you're using your time most effectively. Because that's all we have in the classroom is we have precious time. And it's a scarce commodity. So to me, it saves time. Okay, great. Um, using methods proven to help learning. Excellent. Teaching facts. Yes. This becomes especially important if you teach um, a lot of students. You really need to be data driven. You don't have as much time with them. Excellent. I liked everybody's input. Let's see what we can learn in this session. So I'll go first. Um, I'm going to introduce myself very briefly. I've been, I'm Dr. Peggy Simmingson. I've been in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction since 2008. And I'm a former bilingual ESL teacher. So talk about data. I mean, we kept data in English. We kept data in Spanish. You know, we kind of had to do dual or double the work, if you will, because we were tracking so many things, language, content, reading, everything. My PhD is in language and literacy from UT Austin. And then I came up here, and I've been here for seven years as a professor. And I'm an associate professor, and I do research in the area of technology and literacy. That's my little niece in the picture. And I like to make videos of her becoming literate and learning. Here are a few key ideas from this session. I think everyone would agree with this one. Um, do not teach to the test, right? Data isn't used just to target for the test. It's used all year long. Um, in many ways, it's not just test driven, although it feels it can feel like that sometimes. The other key idea you're going to see here with our speakers and our presentation is to involve students in the process. That's really key, is involving them, letting them know how they're doing along the way, daily and weekly, beyond just your six week benchmark data. So it's really important to involve students and let them know how their learning is going. That's really motivating to students, and I liked it too as a teacher because kids want to know how they're doing, right? Um, and so I'm going to break it down into three parts, collecting data, analyzing data, and action. Because without the action steps, data is meaningless. It's just something you put on a shelf and forget about or leave on a computer. So collect data, analyze, and action steps. Okay, a couple of terms I'll just go over really briefly. You may or may not know these, but everyone needs to know these jargon terms for data-driven teaching. Um, so Nellie's also going to talk about baseline data, but that's your starting point. You have a few weeks 
in the beginning of the year to collect this baseline data. Something I did too was I looked at the previous year's data. That's also baseline data. So if I teach fourth grade, I'm going to also look at their end of year third grade scores. I'm going to look at their third grade scores in, you know, across the year. I want to look for growth. I want to look for progress. I want to look for targeted areas. And I always included on my spreadsheet not just baseline data for that grade, but, base, but information from the previous year. That was also part of my baseline data. I liked the big picture. Some people don't like to do that. They like to just start, start fresh and new. I didn't. I always wanted to know the big picture on students. So you also have formative or ongoing data. Formative data is something you collect daily or weekly. What's the advantage of formative data, do you think? Like, how is it useful versus just collecting it every six weeks or even every nine weeks? To me, formative data is, is going to help you plan your actual teaching, right? Like, your benchmark data might help you group students or know who's, you know, needing trouble in big areas, but at a very micro level, yes, I like that. You can see progress in real time. You can make small adjustments and not waste time. Perfect. Exactly. And it comes down to time. And how are you going to use it? And then you do have those summative assessments. And that might be at the end of a unit. That might be at the end of um, just a random time frame, which is like six weeks or nine weeks in most schools. And so that's also useful, but not as useful as formative data. So formative data. Use these terms around your school administrator. They love it. Formative data is more useful. Um, and then again, another related term to formative data is informal data. Can you think of examples of informal classroom data? So Allie mentioned obs observing students. And I think if you document that, that's perfect. Running records, yes, with literacy. Um, quick quizzes, uh, computer-based assessments, you know, that are just quick and simple or informal. I see observations, checklists. Perfect. Checklists are great. Um, multiple response strategies. So a multiple response strategy is, is that like where a student hold up a card, A, B, C, D, or yes, no. I also thought of um, Socrative. So when you, do, when you do something where students are playing a game-like thing like Socrative, you can kind of get a quick check, right, where students are doing. Or Kahoot. I think Kahoot is used in some districts. Yeah, that occurred to me, too. Those are informal assessments and can give you quick snapshot data on how the students are doing on targeted skills or knowledge. And then every, everybody knows formal assessments. Um, does diagnostic testing fit into informal the informal category? That's a good question. I think diagnostic testing is a bit more formal because it's standardized. Diagnostic testing usually has to um, follow certain directions and guidelines. And when we are doing diagnostic testing, we really have to go by the book with that. Whereas informal, I always think of informal um, assessment and data as more open. But formal assessment, yes. I think diagnosing students using diagnostic tools is, tends to be more formal. Um, and then we screen students. So one example is K through 2 students are screened for dyslexia. That's an example of just checking on basic areas like phonological awareness and phonics and fluency to make sure that we're checking to see who might face challenges and who needs further testing. And then I think our speakers are going to talk a bit about progress monitoring which is collecting data regularly, maybe every Friday. You are maybe currently every the only week. person in this conference. I think someone just joined our session. There are some examples, too, of digital assessments, like iStation. Have you guys used any of these? iStation, Schoolology, or Google Classroom provide some built-in ways to assess. Finally, um, some other ideas. Okay, iStation, and maybe you can mention iStation when you share. Some final ideas are spreadsheets. Learn how to use Excel. Learn to, you know, make columns of the multiple measures that you're doing so it's not just one data source. Multiple measures are key. 
involve students in analysis and help them chart the progress. I'm going to share an example in a second of a reading fluency chart, and that's one easy way to, to use a bar graph to chart data. And then finally, decide your action steps and interventions. So here's an example from a great website called Hello Literacy, and she's willing to share her ideas, so I put the attribution on top. So you've got a fluency graph, and so you, you help students to use a crayon or whatever, just pretend like I'm going to turn that into a bar graph, and you say, okay, you're at 60 words correct per minute. Let's set a goal for next week, and it has to be a realistic goal, like maybe an additional five words per minute, and then students love to see the progress, right, and so they may be up here next week. And you can talk about ways to improve fluency, which is the targeted area here. And then she's also got other types of charts that show across the year, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. So that's much, the much bigger picture of data and tracking data and involving students with data. So finally, Action steps, determine who needs intervention and on what skills. Keep those intervention groups flexible and ongoing. You need to re review your groups according to who needs help on what. Also, grade-wide and grade-level discussions of data helps. School-wide planning helps and is ideal. And then student self-assessment, where you have them do checklists and reflect. And I'm actually going to turn it over now to Nellie, and she's going to talk and show you some examples of some of the themes I've just gone over. So we're ready for you, Nellie. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm able to switch through the, the slides, but um, oh, here you go. <laughs> okay, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a UCA okay. alumna. And, um, I'm actually working on my master's as well, so I'm really excited to be back here and share anything that, you know, can be helpful to anyone. Um, I am I am early childhood oriented. I've been working with pre-kindergarteners for five years now, but um, I have worked with also with youth and young adults for about 11 years. So I, I do love to pass on anything that I do know. <laughs> If anyone has their audio on, you might want to turn it off just because of the echo. Thanks. Are you still there, Nelly? Yes. Yes, I am here. <laughs> okay, great. Um, but, okay. On this next slide, um, it just it talks about the importance of baseline data. Um, so, like Dr. Simpson mentioned, uh, baseline data just gives us uh, a starting point. Uh, it just really lets you know where your students are. Um, in my experience working with pre kindergartners, I really don't have any data at all uh, from any previous year. So, uh, it's really important to pre-screen the students and see what they know. Um, do they know their letters? Um, do they know their sounds? Um, just a very basic, and it really gives you an idea of how much need, you know, how much more you need to focus in your students and, and how to tier them, how to group them, and, and how to help them better. So it's definitely important to always um, start the first week, so that's pretty much what we do just pre-screen them and work with them and, and see where they are. Um, and, it, and even for upper grades, it's important to see um, what the students can do without intervention. What can they do on their own? Um, so it, it is very important to start collecting all that information and to definitely keep um, all of that data um, as you go because we definitely want to see the areas where they need to improve and how you can uh, accommodate their, their needs. Cause we do have students with different needs um, as they come into school. Right. Okay, so there's the next slide. Um, I want to talk about common assessments. Um, that's I know that in upper grades sometimes, you know, you have your running records that is like your standard um, assessments that you have. 
um, in early childhood, we tend to have a lot of common assessments that we try to do uh, as a grade level. So it's really important to work collaboratively and um, and just kind of talk about the different um, content areas that we really want to know at the beginning of the year. Um, definitely, we always want to uh, meet together and and see where we want them to where we want it to be by, let's say, the first semester. So we always um, sit and do something commonly, and we want to make sure that we're always on the same page. And um, I, I know Dr. Smith has a question. Um, what are some of the examples um, of how I can use data uh, to group students? Um, well, uh, after I assess students, we also come together as, as a group, and, and we kind of look at the trends. Um, we see some of the areas where the students might have, you know, been struggling. Um, I know I teach bilingual students, so I like to also meet with the bilingual teachers and see um, if they found that some of our students, let's say, they're struggling more with vocabulary or um, advocating or just different concepts that are specific to our students. And then, you know, we can figure out ways that we can do better interventions and activities with them. That way we can get them ready once we start doing uh, formal assessments. Because even in pre-K, it's interesting that we started doing uh, more formal assessments. And um, a lot of it is done online now, but we do want our students to be successful and to be ready for the next grade. So we definitely um, sit every six weeks, um, every week even, and see where our, how our students are progressing and see what else we can do in our small groups more than anything so that we can get our students for um, for everything, not just the assessment. We definitely don't want to just teach the, to the um, the test. We want them to be ready and have all the skills uh, they need uh, to be successful. Uh, so um, Allison also has a question. Um, using individual reading conferences to determine reading strategy groups composition. Yes, that's definitely uh, very important. Um, our, our students are, are not reading at the, the children that I do work with, but it's definitely important to involve them and to make them feel successful. Um, I always try to make the learning be about them, always make them feel like that they are part of the classroom, that everything that we do is, you know, is for them and that there is a purpose the, for what we what we do in the classroom. The first thing I always ask my students is, you know, why are we in school? What what are we here for? You know, why is this why is this important? So making everything purposeful and letting them see, giving them real life examples of of where we can use what we're learning. Why is it important to learn how to read or know our numbers? You know, it it really makes them have a better appreciation of everything that they are learning. Even as little as elementary, they they definitely make those connections. Uh, so as I was mentioning earlier, it's very meeting back with your teams. Um, and I know on my campus, uh, we're very big about meeting in vertical teams as well. So um, I found that it's very useful to to meet often, not just every six weeks or every semester, but you know even once or twice every every month if possible um, to just come together and see what other areas. Um, our school is struggling is struggling in. Um, I found that um, even in in math, um, we, all of our math teachers meet together, and we find areas where the students are struggling in fifth, sixth grade. And we think even as early as pre-K, we can really start introducing concepts and start, you know, just getting them ready for those concepts that will, you know, be difficult for them. So it's it's been really good to sit and plan, um, not just with your own grade level, but also vertically. Um, oh, really Nellie, can, um, can you turn up your mic if possible, or turn your audio up just a bit, or maybe speak a tiny bit louder? Sure. Is this a little okay, thanks. Okay, great. Um, okay, let me see. Um, so, Let's yes, see, next slide. Okay. Comment assessments. and. Um, I was seeing uh, progress monitoring. Um, it's important to 
just develop measurable objectives uh, and to meet the students' needs and concerns. Um, we were also, I was also mentioned that tiering students according to their growing abilities. Um, that was something important that also uh, Dr. Simpson mentioned. Need to be flexible groups. Uh, it's important to have our students um, be placed in, in groups where they feel successful, but also as they're progressing, we can also, you know, move them and just have, be exposed to working with different students, especially, in, you know, with students that are bilingual. It's great to have them in bilingual pairs and, and learn off of a, a lot of their students that might be successful in the other language as well. So um, just continuing to um, assess students throughout the year and document their progress. Um, that's always a great thing. I also keep a binder with me where I'm keeping all of their um, their progress. And, you know, I do uh, in my small groups even, I also have my spreadsheets where I keep, um, you know, tabs of kind of how they're progressing weekly and how we do every every how we can work better with them. And definitely our data and work samples that are collected can also be used when uh, referring students for additional academic support. So anything that that you guys can keep along the way for like a portfolio is also really helpful. Um, students that, um, that need speech intervention or anything really, or even for tags. So it's great to everything um, everything together and have great uh, records. Uh, so for me, as, um, as we had mentioned before, uh, it's important to start with your, your baseline data. Um, whether, you know, you're in an upper grade, um, you can always refer back to running records or the previous year. It, it helps. Um, I know some people don't like to. Uh, you know, they want to start fresh, but it is important to have that background knowledge and see, you know, if a child already has an IEP or anything, and see which, you know, what you can do to start the year with the student and help them the best possible. Uh, so having your common assessments, um, whether there is a grade level or if they're, you know, state uh, mandated, uh, you can also, you know, work with the grade level. Uh, reviewing your data is definitely important. You want to do that right away and, you know, just talk to the people in your team and see if there's any trends, anything that they maybe see themselves in their students and maybe that's something that at the grade level you guys can work on so that you can strengthen. Hearing your, your groups, you definitely want to be flexible and make sure that, that they as they're progressing, you're also um, moving them in groups so you can uh, assist better. And of course, your progress monitoring, you always want to continue to um, assess them, uh, whether it's informally or formally, and also keep record of everything that you do, your intervention, if they're working or not, and also making reflections, self-reflections for you as a um, Noticing if, if there are certain areas where where you think you need more help, I always I always reach out to you know a specialist or you know principal and ask for additional resources or or help if I know that that um there's a particular just reaching out and asking yes. for help is always a totally true. I, I used to do that also. Okay, great. And Nellie has her contact information here, and we'll have time for Q&A at the very end. Nellie, thank you so much. Let's give her a virtual round of applause for presenting. All right, good job. Um, and so thank you. And Allie, we'll turn it over to you. That was great advice. Okay, your turn. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Capasso, and I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about something a little bit different. So we've talked about how to collect data and how to, um, how to monitor our students in the classroom, and that's obviously the most important thing. But what I'm going to talk to you about today 
is how to involve your students in your data analysis process and in instructional planning. And I have to say that uh, I've always worked with first and second graders. I've, I've never gone any higher than second grade. But I, I think that it's really powerful to share your data with your students and share those strategic goals. Uh, I always tell my kids, you are not a test score. Um, and certainly, we are not teaching to the test. But at the same time, the students do need to understand what, what would be a goal that I can set for myself this year that would be realistic and would be something that I truly feel that I can own and live up to? And how do I know if I'm doing a good job? What does that mean? Um, what would that look like? And how can I tell when I get what we're working on? So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and progress to my first slide. So why would I want to involve my students in the planning process? And this is especially an important question in the lower grades. Um, when we think about very young children, because it, it might seem like they might not understand quite as well uh, what's going on and what our goals are. But over the years, I've done this every year, and I've, I've shared uh, with my students where we're going for the year. We've made a mission statement every year, and this is part of our district initiative, but it's also something that I truly believe in. So um, at the beginning of the year, we start by talking about uh, where we want to go as a grade level, um, as far as testing scores and as far as also how do we want to look as readers by the end of the year? What, what will that look like when we do a good job reading and a good job as mathematicians, scientists, and um, exploring social studies? So when we share with our students where we want to go and have them set their own individual um, goals, they have a sense of ownership. And they feel like they know where they're going. They feel like the classroom is a team. And they feel like um, they can work together to do something like creating this mission statement. Now, this is my mission statement from a couple of years ago. And what we do is we show our kids our strategic goals based on last year's data. And of course, the teachers have worked on that during the, uh, during the summer. Um, so we talk about uh, what are these tests that we're going to take. Um, let's talk about, well, not just tests, but when we end the year, how do we want to look as learners? And so we put all of that into our strategic goals during the summer, but we share those with our kids and, and let them talk a little bit about it. So at that time, we sit down and we write our mission statement. Um, we talk about uh, what do we need to do well together so that we can all accomplish these goals. And also talk about um, what do we want to include as far as, um, as far as our subject? What are we going to learn in each subject? And we do this over a course of a couple of days. And then together, we construct this mission statement. So that's the first part that, that really builds community at the beginning of the year. And it also gives them a sense of where we're going to go. I, I usually include something cute at the end, like this uh, at the end that says, never, never, never give up. That was our, um, our mission statement last year. Um, and uh, then I think a couple of years ago, actually. And then this year, one of our focuses on our campus is uh, kindness. So I think we have something like that at the end. And then we also have um, always do the right thing even when no one's watching. So uh, we always include a little catchphrase like that at the end. So, um, so we're talking about building classroom community by doing this. But also, when we put our goals in each subject in the mission statement, it gives them kind of a, a map of where we're going to go throughout the year. And when we do things like this, it also reminds our students that everything we're doing is about them. This is all about them. And we want to make sure that they're supported, that they feel like their opinion matters, and that they feel like um, everything that we're doing is coming together because they're helping the planet. So this mission statement is a powerful thing to do at the very beginning of the year, and we have ours up for this year as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few first steps in, uh, in sharing data with your students. Uh, the first step is the mission statement, which I just discussed. My class always picks a team name, too, so it's, it's just something kind of fun. This year, they chose to call themselves the Odd Squad, which at first I didn't understand. But apparently, there's a PBS show called The Odd Squad this year, and it's actually really cute. 
But I, I thought, where did that come from? <laughs> it was interesting trying to find out where that was from. But we all voted, and that's what we are this year, the Odd Squad. So we made a goal um, as the Odd Squad that we were going to be prepared for third grade by doing certain things. Based on that goal, each week we take one of the strategies in the teeth and we place that up. Um, it's, of course, also based on our plans. So, for instance, our first goal um, for the first six weeks was um, that we would be able to compare and contrast using a Venn diagram. So, um, so we, we look at this four-square model that we use. And uh, we, we've always called this the PDSA, so plan, do, study, act. And this is a part of the continuous improvement model. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may not. But when we look at this, um, basically, the plan is, what, what are we going to work on this, this week? What do we want to learn? Um, and for, for the first week of this year, it was compare and contrast. And this one is about story structure. Um, we always try to stick with a certain strategy. So the strategy um, for this week is our story map. We always call it the roller coaster story map because it it's looks like a roller coaster. Um, the, for the previous week, it was a Venn diagram. So it's always something that, um, that just brings into mind a visual for them. Oh, we're going to use the Venn diagram. I know exactly how that looks, and I know uh, where to find it. But uh, also, we show how to use it down on the uh, lower left-hand side there. And uh, when we show how to use it, we talk about what are the steps? What, what are we going to do when we, when we fill this in? So for, for the story map, what steps are we going to use to fill this in? And we usually do that part. Um, this is the study. We do this. I think I have to press down to make my son go. There we go, right there. Um, and so when we do our study, um, we might do that a couple days into the week when we've practiced a couple of times, and that way the kids know where we're going with that and uh, what to do when they get there. So um, the story map that you're looking at is a strategy that we work on over quite a few weeks. Uh, this is quite a big goal. It's actually uh, a model that they use in fourth grade that we've been asked to bring down and, and start preloading into, uh, into our curriculum. So it takes quite a while for them to kind of get used to that. Um, this, this Venn diagram week that I'm talking about is the one I'll focus on because it was a one-week unit. And it will be different periods of time. So um, it might be that you have one goal that will take uh, three weeks, and one of them might be one week. And, and we talk about that in our classroom. Why do they take different amounts of time? Why would that be? Um, that's another thing that we discuss. So this is happening, this, uh, this plan and this do. I go over this every single day. So we all recite the rules. Uh, every morning, and we talk a little bit about our mission statement and where we're going and how we're doing with that. And then I come over here and I just really quickly, we have one for language arts and one for math, but we also talk about our strategies uh, in the other subject areas. So what we do is we say, okay, remember our weekly plan for this week is, is we're going to be uh, comparing and contrasting, which is my example, and then we're going to be using a Venn diagram. Um, so that's something I go over every day. It's really, really quick. Then I walk over to my daily objectives, which will correlate with my weekly plan. So this is something that we refer back to constantly. Then over the week, when we do these things, when we're comparing and contrasting, or when it's math and we're using our, um, our story problem frame, we talk about, oh man, we talk about that every morning. Where do we have those things? Remember, where do we keep those strategies? Oh, that's our weekly learning plan. And this is what we're, we're uh, working on doing this week so that they remember at the end of the week we're going to come back to this and think about how well we've done um, as a group using these strategies. And so um, we also like to assess the use of these strategies in several different ways. And the reason that I wanted to use my compare and contrast from last week is that we assessed that strategy in three different ways. Uh, the first way was that we actually had them fill out a Venn diagram comparing and contrasting two different stories with specific criteria for mastery. So they had to have uh, two 
things about each individual story, and then they had to have two things in the middle to compare them uh, in their Venn diagram. So the second way that we assessed that is that we had a, um, a test uh, based upon our weekly story, and we had uh, about three questions about comparing and contrasting in that test that had a, um, that had a, a focus on comparing and contrast, and it actually showed a Venn diagram in two out of the three questions. And then the third thing that we did, and I believe it's on the next slide, is that uh, I had them assess for themselves um, how well they thought they could use the Venn diagram and how well they understood it. So uh, you can see here that most of them felt fairly confident, and there were a few that felt like they needed a little bit of time, which I thought was, was great because really what I want from this process is just for them to understand, do I get it? Do I not get it? I think it's really, really important for them to actually recognize that they, um, they do have uh, the ability to understand whether or not they're getting it. And what do they want to do? What do they need to do so that they can understand where they're falling short and where they don't understand? Um, so when we get together at the very end of the week, we get together with something called a data folder. And in that data folder, we have a shortened version of our PDSA cycle that we went over earlier with the four squares, but it just has two squares for them that we put into our data folder. So we just talk about what was the strategy we learned this week. We learned to compare and contrast with a Venn diagram. We draw the Venn diagram. And when am I going to use that? So that's where that fourth box comes in, the act. When do I use this strategy? And we use it whenever we need to compare and contrast. This is one of the things that's really neat about this is that um, I talked to them at the end of the week and I said, well, what if we're in math and we need to compare and contrast different geometric shapes? Could we use it in diagram? And they agreed that we could use it in any subject. So the power is really in the discussion. The students are going to be more aware of their individual proficiency with the skill. That's the first thing. But then... Together they can decide, if we're proficient with this strategy, where else can we be using this? Um, last week in math, we also talked about counting money, and together we decided that we just weren't ready to move on. We had used the hundreds chart to help us to count by tens and fives and, uh, and 25. We had uh, worked on our number sense, but we just were still not getting it, so we're going to spend a little bit more time on counting money and we talked a little bit more about where that was going to lead us and what other strategies we can use. We also established who felt like they were proficient with counting money, and those friends are going to be uh, our peer tutors for next week. So uh, that discussion was great because it really made them uh, feel like a team. And uh, in some ways, I've kind of already decided that we wouldn't be moving on, but my principal has this, has this great word that she always uses, facil manipulate. So she, she always says that it's nice, even if you do know they're not ready to move on, can they acknowledge that? Because if they can, that's where the real power is. And uh, at that point, you realize that they're, they're really driving themselves in the learning process, and they, they really have the desire to get it. Um, the class can analyze what aspects of the skill confuse them. One of the neatest things I think that I saw last year when I taught only math is that we had this um, oh, um, MRC, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge your question here. Um, I'm going to come back to that. Um, in math last year, we had these weekly tests that we were going to uh, analyze as a group. And so uh, MRC was talking about anonymity. So, um, so one of the things that you can do um, during the analysis of, of, for instance, a weekly test in math, so we had to practice for these star practice tests that we were required to take. So we were taking um, quite verbose tests. Um, that's how our star practice tests are. And 
uh, I would have my kids kind of analyze what they weren't getting on a post-it note. So it was anonymous. And then at that time, they might, uh, they might choose to give it to me. They might choose to keep it. And we would just talk about what the students realized about what they weren't getting. So, um, so it was really powerful because some of the students would say things like, I knew the math. I knew all the math. But the reading confused me. The wording of the question confused me. So that the kids could see, we do get the math. And we understand how to use the strategy that we were going to apply to our test, but there were other things getting in our way. Uh, it's, it's a great way of, of kind of uh, boosting their confidence, because sometimes um, they can see it's more complicated than I know this or I don't know this. So, um, but that's a good way to keep it anonymous, maybe anonymous comments about, if I didn't get it, here's what I didn't get. And then you can share that if they want you to share. But I never require my kids to share. Um, it's just something that can be um, that can be helpful, and sometimes they want to share, and I applaud them for doing that because they know it's helpful to the team. So that's another thing that we um, that we encourage, but they can remain anonymous if they want to. I hope that helped. So uh, one other thing that we do at the end of the week, and this is unique to my classroom, but I, I feel it's important, is that this is a really quick kind of five-minute thing that we do at the end of the week. I give them this letter. And um, it's just a really quick thing about, hey, mom and dad, or they can always choose who they write to. Here's what we're learning this week. We learned to compare and contrast, so this is from that week. And then we used what we call TAPS for, um, for math problem solving. And uh, we also talk about what we learned in social studies or science. We're three weeks and three weeks on that, so we, we do one of the two. Um, at the end, I always try to have them do something they're proud of from the learning week, and then something that they need to work on. Um, because our campus is so focused on kindness, sometimes the thing that they're proud of is just that they, they helped a friend um, when they didn't have to or something like that. But I try to get them to focus academically. So this young man had a really good example. And I, I know it's not quite as easy to see as I wish it was. But um, he was proud because he had done well in fast math. And my kids love fast math. I don't know if you use that, but it's a great program. And they can instantly see their progress on fast math uh, as far as fat fluency is concerned. But the thing that he wanted to work on is becoming a better reader. And I loved that because we had a conference talking about um, talking about how he's doing a great job in reading, but he, he needs to increase his stamina. So he really owned that. And that was, for him, he's, a, he's one of my higher students. So that was one of the only things that he could really improve on. So that's something that, uh, that I was really proud of him for thinking of. Because one of the things I want is to have my kids really always understanding that they can always improve on something. Um, I, I just included this to remind you that when you go into this, especially with younger children, it's not going to be an easy process at first, especially if they didn't do it last year. So it's something where, um, where you kind of have to build and you have to accept what you have for that week and then move on and encourage them to go a little deeper next week. So for instance, this young lady who is, is so, so sweet, um, she, she got all hundreds on everything she did all week. So I understand why the thing that she wants to work on is singing and dancing. I would be singing and dancing too. She made great grades. Um, but I, you know, I did talk to the, all of the kids the next week and it was, it was anonymous. And you know, I said, hey guys, I know that, that we, uh, that we, we love it when we make great grades, but let's try to think about the one area that we're not comfortable in. And let's try to really work on that area and think about what would be something that we could improve on. And let's think about if we're making all hundreds, what does that mean about us? Where do we need to be going next? And, and do you need to talk to Mrs. Capasso? And I can give you some more things to do because we always want to be getting better. We never want to be standing still. So this is uh, in conclusion, this is building that grit that they need. They need to understand that they always want to be improving. We do mention test scores. We mention them uh, fairly frequently, but that's not to say that we focus on them. What we focus on is that process of, uh, of getting our kids to understand that they're always building our community and our team, and we're always striving to do something much better um, 
next week and, and to, to make progress and growth. I think I've caught over on my time. I apologize, but uh, I will share my email. I'll share my email address in the in the comments. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to share uh, the forms or anything that I've shared today, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Thank you, Allie. Um, also, feel free, Allie, to type in the chat window about answering any questions while we're wrapping up. So, Dr. Pan, do you want to share one or two key points from your slide? Hello, Dr. Stevenson, and hello, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank um, all of you for uh, such a wonderful presentation. And I just wanted to uh, share my thoughts on how to use uh, Excel file for collecting your data and for graphing them. And um, as mentioned in this slide, data can be uh, either qualitative or quantitative. So I will not go into qualitative data uh, analysis or graphing. I'll just talk about a little bit of how to use Excel file for um, uh, graphing data. Um, oftentimes, people have the tendency of writing everything on Excel file, and we consider them as data. But from the analyst's point of view, um, data can be stored in the form of variables, and variables are the columns, and rows are used for uh, participants. So uh, if there are several variables associated with uh, one participant, then those variables will run down the columns. And similarly, if there are uh, 10 participants, there will be 10 rows for uh, those 10 participants. And once you have data on a particular variable, and if you want to draw a bar graph, you can click on the insert menu or insert tab. And then Excel has um, very interactive tools at the top. It will show what type of bar graph you want to draw, or if you want to draw a pie chart for a different type of variable, uh, you can do that by clicking on the pie chart um, menu. And similarly, line graph is very good for uh, showing progress as uh, I was seeing on slide number 19 when uh, Nelly mentioned about baseline data. Um, you can have baseline data taken at the beginning of the semester or school year. And if you are assisting students monthly, you may have uh, data for several months. And if you want to show progress, you can use line graph for those type of um, data. Scatter plot is used mainly if, if you have two variables and you think they are related. For example, pre-test and post-test, you can draw a scatter plot in order to show visually how the scores are related. And Excel also provides formulas for um, obtaining the mean, standard deviation, median, mode, as well as um, some other statistics, for example, correlation. And for this, you have to type equal sign in the cell or in the, in the box where you want to compute mean or standard deviation. You type equal to sign. And uh, for mean, uh, Excel uses average. Excel does not use mean. So after typing equal sign, you have, you have to type average. And for median, uh, you'll just type equal and median. For mode, equal and mode. And for standard deviation, you'll type equal STD EV. So ST for standard, DEV um, for deviation. And for correlation, you'll type equal to sign and C-O-R-R-E-L. So in a newer version of Excel, when you type equal sign and type a couple of letters, it will suggest the function okay, that you thanks, are looking Dr. for. So I have also, yeah, I've also created Excel file for that purpose. But because of time, we will not go over that. If you like, I can uh, yes. send it to Dr. Samuelson and Dr. Samuelson. Okay, great. Somewhere. So uh, that's all.
you have any questions, please write me email. Thank you. M. Pants at UTA.edu. He's our statistics guru. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pants. Um, everyone, type something you learned and we'll wrap up. And we hope you have a great rest of the day. Um, we didn't get to answer all the questions, but our presenters left their email addresses in the chat window. And feel free to write any of us. And thank you so much for joining. Remember, the resources will be on social media. We have another webinar on October 10th. And we hope that you can join us and keep learning with us. Thank you for joining with us today. Post your final thought as an exit ticket into the chat window. Thanks, everyone. Let's get a round of applause for the presenters. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Pant and Nellie and Allie.